Well, you just mentioned judges uh, who helped form the law. I, I assume you're referring to common law. Is that right? Yes. So tell us, tell us a little bit more about then the common law of England, because obviously it, it affected American jurisprudence. And continues to. So a, a sort of technical definition of the common law is judge-made rules in particular cases that embody reasoning, logic, custom, and tradition to decide a particular case. Now clearly every case that comes before a judge involves a unique set of facts. And when common law judges discover that the facts before them don't quite fit within the body of rules that they have previously developed, they are free to modify the law to accommodate that changing circumstance or set of facts or social situation. But they don't do so frequently. As a consequence, the common law has evolved very, very, very slowly over time. I'll give you an example of a common law rule or set of rules that we still um, understand in the United States today. The law of negligence and tort law generally reflects a common law notion that as members of a society, you and I owe each other duties for which there is no contractual obligation. We have a lot of duties to each other because of contracts. But the law of tort, and particularly the law of negligence, imposes on us a duty to treat one another in a particular way because that's the way you do it in a civilized society. So the very existence of tort law seems kind of at odds with social contract theory, but still plays a very significant role in our legal system today. The common law also presumes that judges have the power to make law if the legislature hasn't. So they can fill in the gaps where a legislature has not acted. Um, today, we are watching legislatures, even modernly, defining elements of crimes, and therefore what the relevant defenses are. Before legislatures do that, and in my state it didn't start until the 19th century, judges got to define through common law the elements of the crime of murder, manslaughter, arson, etc. Um, the other thing that has guaranteed, if you will, that the common law has a, an ongoing impact in our culture is William Blackstone's commentaries on the laws of England that I mentioned earlier. Blackstone, like Aristotle, was great at classifying and simplifying. And so he broke the law into essentially four categories. His treatise talks about the rights of persons, which includes relationships like marriage and guardianship and children and wards and so on. And then the rights of things, which is the law of personal property and real estate. Then he has public wrongs, which are crimes and misdemeanors, and private wrongs, contracts and obligations that uh, we have to others that aren't covered by contracts, such as torts. Well, there's a very simplified way to make sense of the law. And the colonists relied heavily on Blackstone States after independence continued to rely heavily on Blackstone, as do lawyers to this day. Blackstone is cited uh, more frequently than, than I think uh, we could imagine. But what's so remarkable about the commentaries on the laws of England is it's easily understood by lawyers and non-lawyers alike. 